Okay, I think we can make the start. Welcome everybody, um, no matter from where you're joining us, um, to this first of a, of a series of presentations. Um, today's presentation is In Pursuit of More Energy Design Challenges and Choices, and it marks the first of our talks of the week. Um, just to give you a little brief um, introduction to the, to the following uh, talks in the series we have. We have talks on composites specifically, um, some uh, webinar on blade maintenance, as well as some issues around sustainability and supply chain and uh, maximizing UK opportunities in the blade space. So without further ado, we'll get on today's um, agenda. So firstly, um, we'll have uh, a keynote from Tony Quinn, our test and validation director at RE Catapult. Um, I'd say some few words then around some key challenges uh, around blade design. Then we have two great guest speakers, um, Andrew from LM and Sabrina from ACT Blade. We'll then have a, a 10 minute Q&A from, from the audience um, for, for 10 minutes or so. And then finally, um, a, a small panel uh, discussion before close. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, invite Tony Andrew and Sabrina in turn to introduce themselves. Hi Mark, thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Tony Quinn. I'm uh, previously Test and Validation Director for Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Currently, uh, just about to take up my role as Technology Development Director for Catapult. I'm very passionate about uh, offshore wind and in particular uh, innovation. Uh, we have currently one of the largest wind turbine test facilities in the world, uh, specializing in blade testing. Thanks, Tony. Um, and my name, I, I forgot to introduce myself at the start, but um, my name is Mark Forrest. I'm the Blades Research Leader, and I sit within the Research and Technical Capability Directorate within the Catapult. Andrew. Hi there. I'm Andrew Bellamy. Uh, I'm Senior Director for Manufacturing, Engineering and Technology at LM. Uh, I've been in the blades business for almost 25 years. Um, so when we get on to some of the discussion later, some of the tips, uh, re removable tips that we have for blades are larger than the first blades I was building, uh, which were, you know, sort of 10, 15 metre blades. Um, so I'm based in the UK, but my team is spread throughout the world. Um, and, uh, and we manufacture in, in 14 different locations. So I spend a lot of my time with my teams uh, out in the different factories around the world. Right, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, Sabrina. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sabrina Malpede, co-founder and managing director of ActBlade Limited. Um, I am an aeronautical engineer with a PhD in aerospace. My PhD was about developing a technology for a thin, light, flexible structure that works in the wind. Uh, so the first application was uh, in yachting. So our companies uh, were the leader of software application for uh, the yachting industry, designing sales and rig all over the world. And the uh, last, um, uh, and last five years I've been trying, uh, we spent spent actually the time to apply all our knowledge and expertise in composite, lightweight structural material, textile to the uh, wind energy industry. So we, we are here to introduce a new type of wind turbine blade, the next generation of blades, the active blade. Super, thanks very much, Sabrina. Uh, Tony, would you like to kick things off? Yeah, absolutely, Mark. So thank you very much indeed. And, and thank you for inviting me to speak uh, this afternoon. Um, and I, I thought I'd share some thoughts uh, with you on, um, on the, the, the scale of the market opportunity um, and indeed the um, some of the challenges for my fellow panelists in the design, manufacture, deployment, and end of life or circular economy associated with blade design in particular. So I thought, I thought I'd, I, I'm, anybody who knows me knows that I'm a fond of a graph or two, and uh, I've managed to squeeze in uh, three graphs on a single page. 
uh, here. Uh, and I guess, you know, as we drive towards net zero globally, that offshore wind is becoming the backbone of our plan to decarbonize the electricity system. And in a recently published report in the top right-hand corner by the Global Wind Energy Council, it's showing a trajectory out to 2030 where we need to have installed over 3,000 gigawatts cumulatively of wind capacity uh, in the world. And, and around about 20% of that roughly would be represented by offshore wind. And what, and what the graph shows is that already in our current growth trajectory, which is the blue bar, we're already falling behind what we need to do to achieve our ambition of net zero. So, so the point is that there's this burgeoning demand for wind turbine technology. And indeed by 2050, I think the forecasts are that we should be up at somewhere in excess of 6,000 gigawatts globally. And in Europe, that demand is very, very similar. And in the UK specifically, I think we're facing something in the region of a threefold increase in our annual electricity demand. I think currently we're consuming around about 300 to 400 terawatt hours, and, and, and we need to increase that by threefold. And then the government have recently produced their energy security policy, requiring that we are setting an ambition to install 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. And only recently, the Crown Estates have backed that up with some sort of marine spatial planning in April 22, of the, uh, uh, in April of this year, trying to plan out how we meet all of the competing needs of environmental impact, navigational. Uh, needs of the uh, uh, of the oceans and this demand to hit our net zero targets, and that means really that what 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 we're seeing is a combined drive for innovation with industrial scale deployment. The bottom graph shows why offshore wind in particular has been chosen as the mode of decarbonizing the electricity system with a rapid fall in cost of energy from offshore wind at the same time as we begin to ramp up. The chart is slightly outdated, it's showing a target of 40 gigawatts by 2030. And, uh, and, and as I mentioned, the energy security policy recently increasing that by a further 20% to to 50 gigawatts. And in the bottom right hand corner, it shows how that, uh, that cost reduction has been driven by large scale innovation in larger turbines. So back in auction round two and auction round one and auction round two, when average size of turbines was around about seven, perhaps eight megawatts, Average price of electricity was 120 pounds per megawatt hour. We can see that the larger turbines driving, uh, as we strive towards 14 and 15 megawatt turbines, bringing the cost down to 40 pounds per megawatt hour. And that's why wind now is the uh, low carbon, low cost form of energy generation of choice of most, of many, many, uh, countries and and that I think is placing a huge challenge for the industry. This rate of change of technology is enormous. At the same time that we need to deploy at industrial scale, UK currently has around about ten gigawatts of installed capacity. So over the next eight years, we need to deploy around about five gigawatts per annum. Tony, could you please uh, reshare your screen? We, we can't see your, your screen. Sorry. Oh, really? Uh, so just, I'm um, sorry about that. 
Just give me a, a second. Can you see my screen now, Mark? Hi, Donny. We can see your notes screen. So if you can just click on to that, it's the top setting that says display settings and switch that around. If you just go up to the very top of that screen, there's a drop down for display settings. Um. I'm not seeing that, unfortunately, Vic. I think it's sharing your other screen so we can see what the main slide is in the next slide. It says no notes if you're using two screens. Let me just stop this share. Now, can you see it? Nope, it's still sharing the same one. I apologise for this. Um, so if, if you click the top, so you, there's three buttons that say show taskbar, display settings and end slideshow. If you click on the display settings one. The next one along. The next one along? Yep, display settings. I'm not seeing a display setting, I'm sorry. That's okay. Can you see? Do you want to just continue on chatting then and we can pick the slides back up later? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. that's fine. I, th I think that's fine. I think I think people are I think people will hopefully get the the message. Yeah, that's fine. I, I, I think so. I think the challenges throughout the product life cycle that we need to address with regard to blade manufacture. Uh, or the design process uh, is uh, increasingly pushing for longer, lighter, stronger blades. I think the questions to be raised are how do we raise tip speeds above 100 meters per second? Do we continue with single structure versus segmented design? And how do we bring along the design certification standards and indeed investor confidence at the same, at the pace of change that the industry is currently experiencing. And in terms of manufacture, currently the, 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 the mode of manufacture is very, very labor intensive with limited automation and yet five gigawatts per annum simply to meet the UK needs is equivalent to one turbine per day for the next eight years. That's equivalent to three blades per day. And I'd like to challenge some of my colleagues as to how we can increase the product, product industrialization or the production of these blades to meet that target. Currently our methods have evolved from a pretty much a craft design and build approach. How do we maintain the quality control? How do we control the resin injection process? As, we, as the, comp, the structures become more complex, the layup becomes more complex. We use a wider range of materials. We have increased section thickness and reduced safety factors. These are some of the challenges that the manufacturing process needs to address. And then in terms of end of life, we have the circular economy challenges. Currently around about 80 percent of a wind turbine is recyclable, but the most difficult area are the blade technologies. How do we move away from thermoset plastics to thermoplastics? 
How do we replace BOTA with PET? How do we introduce new resins into the process? Or alternatively, as Sabrina will no doubt cover, how do we completely disrupt the market with a completely different approach to blade design and manufacture? These are the challenges that I'd like to present to my fellow, fellow panelists. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tony. I'd just like to share my screen and I'll get underway. Okay, um, in the first uh, few minutes, I'd like to take um, specifically around future blade design and manufacturing. Um, and the points I'd like to cover um, is an overall view of RE Catapult's future blade manufacturing vision. Um, talk more specifically around the challenges of large scale blades, um, following on from the introduction that, that Tony has generously made. Um, and in doing so, I'll use a, a, a current program we have running um, called the dual challenge, which is to look at um, 20 plus megawatt feasibility turbines and more specifically look around blade segmentation and additive manufacture. As, as far as the uh, future blade design goes, uh, obviously as Tony alluded to, um, from a craft background, we've only seen incremental change in the way that, that blades are being manufactured. Um, they've just been fortunate enough to, to scale well over the past three decades. However, we're already butting up against a number of technical issues which require um, some intervention. Um, as far as the RRA catapult is concerned, we have a thematic mission of accelerating the UK IP growth for the next generation of blade manufacturing. And more specifically, this comes around, is underpinned by, by three main development objectives. Um, that's a reduction of levelized cost of energy um, to develop technologies for larger floating wind turbines, particularly floating should be emphasized because it unlocks a, a great amount of untapped potential in the country. Um, and thirdly, to reduce the environmental impact of those turbines. So as far as the um, scale related blade challenges go, obviously there's always a drive to, to have larger swept areas um, and that's the way the, the industry has grown um, so well um, onshore particularly, but on offshore, there's a, a, a large um, cost burden, if you like, in terms of um, the, the balance of system costs. So particularly anything under the waterline um, and, and the large burden that floating foundations have, have to pay. Um, but obviously there's always that need to manufacture blades faster and more efficiently. Um, the larger rotors obviously entail higher system loads. Um, so the cascading loads, which occur on the drive chain tower and foundations. Um, and obviously there's a, a great uh, willingness to use high performance lightweight composite materials to produce what we call a, a virtuous mass spiral. Um, so obviously if we can re reduce the loads going in from the blades, um, costs of subsequent um, subcomponents in the system um, can can reduce. Um, and that's why I've put a little note there in, in, the, in the notes of, of, of cost. Um, so one has to ask the question, obviously, is it necessary that you have seek the minimum cost in blades? If indeed you can um, have more expensive blades because you, you've made um, access to materials, for instance, at, at um, a, a higher cost, you may increase the cost of the blade component overall um, have a reflected lower cost in, in the total cost of the system. Another way um, we can look to um, reduce those, those torque loadings, as Tony alluded to, is to operate at higher tip speeds, um, with obviously with all those challenges that that entails. Also, obviously, there's obvious direct manufacturing and installation challenges around manufacturing time of cost of making these larger structures. Um, and, and the, the physical, very practical limitations of, of uh, crane lift capacity um, for the installation of ever larger turbines. And finally, um, the high volume of end of life waste material. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a great drive within the industry um, to produce more recyclable blades. Um, but not only that, of the blades that we do produce, um, we want to extend those lifetimes beyond 30 years. To touch upon this, I'd like to just um, 
to, to go over a lot of these themes, uh, I'd like to highlight uh, a program we currently have running uh, called Jewel, which is a development of, of 20 plus megawatt um, next generation turbines. Uh, and this is a ORE catapult uh, initiated supply chain program, um, basically to look to enhance the use of composite materials across future floating uh, turbine components, not just blades, but um, drivetrain towers uh, as well. Um, this program has been funded by Bayes um, and it's delivered in cooperation with the National Composite Centre. And, and thus far, all major OEMs have, have signed up uh, as part of the Industrial Advisory Board on this program. Um, so it's a quite comprehensive program and obviously being Blades Week, um, we'll look specifically at, at the blade packages we're working on. Um, work package one entails aero design for more tailored and a sensibly higher AEP um, extraction from, from the wind stream. Um, the challenges obviously in leading edge protection are addressed as are the uh, integration problems around root section. Um, Obviously, we want to see higher degrees of automation in blades. So there's a, uh, a work package specifically around blade manufacturing. Um, I'll, I'll go into greater depth around joint segmentation. Um, also, the strong material in terms of um, greater robustness um, and mechanical properties can afford it by, by newer materials on the market. And then we'll get more specifically into um, additive manufacturing of tip sections of those um, tick segments, particularly. We'll also be looking at um, additively manufacturing PET cores for future blades, and also look at next generation of surface coating technologies to try to minimize uh, finishing times. So more specifically, um, as far as segmentation goes, obviously, um, conventional uh, half shell manufacturing routes are a mold centric way of, of producing a blade. Um, unfortunately, as you can see from the diagram on the right, um, this suffers very low uh, mold utilization. So three of those processes, you're, you're basically removing the function of, of um, what the blade's there to do, which is which the blade mold is there to do, which is mold blades. And these ancillary processes, which done in mold, um, take away utilization time from doing that. Instead, we'd like to look at more cell-centric manufacturing um, by switching um, to a, an assembly approach. And this is essentially so we can actually parallelize the, the build process and effectively lower those uh, bottlenecks in both those three areas I, I mentioned, which is the preforming, the web integration, and the bonding. Um, so as part of this, each cell, if you like, if there's a cut by architecture of the blade, um, each cell is effectively optimized for a particular segment being produced. Um, and at a very top level, you can see, um, th this is a study that was done of a conventional build versus a spar cap manufactured with um, AFP or automated fiber placement. Uh, and this segmentation was done over three scenarios, over a, um, a full blade, which is the, the zero case, you can see on the top left in two columns for the two cases, um, and looking at segmenting the blade um, into both three and six segments. And we did a cost study that overall we found that um, there's three segments um, showed optimum cost reduction with a automated fiber placement approach to spa manufacture. Um, and go by going this segmented uh, method, um, it means the economics of, of automation actually become far more favorable in, in smaller um, parts of blade. And a lot of this background benefit is, is around reduced factory footprints that are achievable. And this is obviously becomes uh, increasingly important as we go to 130 plus meter blades that we're looking at for um, 20 megawatt machines. The second area I'd like to, to just touch upon is additive manufacturing applications for blade. Um, uh, many in the audience may know of so far in, in many industries, not just blades, um, the, the first real um, industrial impact that additive has made is around you know, mold tools, jigs and fixtures. Um, and this has been demonstrated by, by numerous groups um, globally um, to produce blades as a cost-effective me measure, which reduces the time uh, for development, um, because obviously making patterns and molds conventionally um, is a very long process and that can be um, massively reduced by an additive um, route to 
tool manufacture. Um, so that's obviously supporting conventional build, but obviously we'd like to see um, an enhanced use of flying parts um, as material capability and architectures uh, are, are more fully explored. Everything from elements such as sandwich cores through to um, subcomponents such as ribbers or ribs and stringers potentially, uh, as well as blade components in their own right, such as winglets or even entire um, blade segment tips. As far as additively manufactured AM blades, here are the, some of the, the, the key aspects we'd like, we, we'd imagine being developed um, or taken advantage of as, as far as a, a future blade. Obviously we see that the blade will be segmented um, of those components that obviously have to be recyclable. It allows a, a modular build process whereby third party manufacturers could be um, as part, so almost like an assembly process. Um, there's potential for lower cost toolless manufacturing where you're printing part directly without the use of a mold. Um, and this obviously additive, the, the, the main advantage is around design freedom, both structurally and aerodynamically of some of the forms and features that can be produced um, which by other methods are either very difficult or just impossible to produce. And there's also advantages in terms of um, which parts we look at around which parts we choose to integrate, which we choose not to, um, around potential mass savings of blade structure. So more specifically, what does a, a segment of additively manufactured blade could potentially look like? Um, Obviously, you can see here, um, a big drive is obviously new topology optimized structures, which are, as I said, only possible using um, additive manufacture where the actual part that you're producing is the tool itself. Um, so there is no tool in this, in this worldview. Um, the approach is obviously uh, subsumes a lot of structural material. So if you like, that could be in, internal um, structural strengthening and stiffening of, of the component. Um, through integrated spar caps and the like, um, or, or shear beams through the cost of lower cost glass uh, shear battens. Uh, and a big advantage of this approach is obviously you replace um, failure prone and costly use of foam sandwich. Um, and finally, as far as the finishing goes, um, and this is a part of the jewel project we're also looking at, um, thermoplastic based um, IMDs for aero surfacing film to eliminate um, blade painting processes. So this is a, more of a summary slide about um, the overall uh, advantages and benefits we, we seem to be, uh, we want to achieve by going to an AM blade. Uh, first is low cost, flexible manufacturing. Um, obviously there's a direct OPEX reduction in labor and, and material waste. Um, it eliminates, as I said, costly and inflexible blade mold tools. It, it unlocks potentially higher manufacturing productivity. And as I've mentioned, it's compatible with a modular external component suppliers and an assembly based process of, of blade design. Uh, what's more, um, because of, of um, the time it takes to make traditional patterns and, and mold tools, um, rapid production changes are implementable. So it means that for, say for segment tips, um, where you want to change an aero design locally, but there's still, you know, there's lots of amortization required of a, of a root section of a blade. Uh, manufacturers could keep that root section and, and still produce parts from that and, and tailor the um, uh, or, or chained molds of, of the seg tip segments in, instead. Um, and obviously there's higher manufacturing uh, efficiency and redundancy if blade components are, are parallelized um, to produce the same length of blade. A, a strong point which um, we'll return to um, again throughout the week actually, um, is around thermoplastic based recyclable material. Obviously um, there's an imperative that this occurs um, and do as much as we can to ameliorate blade end of life issues. And lastly, the, the maximal design freedom, which I've, I've touched upon. Uh, in rounding out, um, this is a bit of a, a product placement, if you like, um, uh, the news that we, within the catapult, um, have just commissioned a, a additively manufactured cell. And this is a state-of-the-art um, cell, which is produced at Blythe. Um, and this is to enable um, rapid development of new blade structures, uh, designs and technologies. 
as far as the featuring of, of these, this um, blade, uh, it's a relatively large print capacity, which allows us to, to produce um, fairly large subcomponents in one piece. Um, it, it's a seven axis um, based system um, with high bead accuracy and control and placement um, with the view of uh, eventual continuous fiber systems deployable. So I'll probably leave it there, but with the summation of basically, obviously um, the scale of the future blades hold significant challenges. Um, the, the dual program is a clear path to enable these, these step changes for future um, blade development. And the important role that blade segmentation has for both cost saving um, and further use of automation and, and logistics, especially in the transportation issues that it, it serves to um, address. And finally, additive manufacturing has potential to unlock further design and cost benefits. And with that, I'd like to um, hand over to our next speaker, Andrew. Thanks very much, Mark. I'm gonna try and get my screen to share, just two seconds. See if I can make this work. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Perfect. We've made it work. Excellent. All right. Thanks very much. And thanks very much for letting me um, take 15 minutes of everybody's time to talk. I'm going to try. There's been a lot in, in the first slides about the, the problems and challenges we face, which um, I'm going to cover a little bit in, in what I'm going to talk about here, but also how we've addressed some of these problems. Not all of them. I can't say we've solved everything yet. Um, and hopefully the ones I can't solve, Sabrina's going to show us how she's going to solve them. Um, so I'll go through these and, uh, and hopefully we'll come out with some good discussion points at the end as well. So um, for those of you who don't perhaps know LM um, quite so well, we're a large blade manufacturer. Um, we have 13 factories around the world building um, upwards of 60 to 70 lines uh, in any one day running. Um, and last year we built uh, just over 13,000 blades. Um, typically, I would say the size at the moment, we go from 47 meters being the smallest one uh, up to 107. And what's been really interesting the last few years is the average size going up quite quickly. So we've always had the extremes, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the very small blades and the very big blades, but the average size has gone up quite dramatically in the last three to four years. Um, and currently sits just at the high end of 70 meters. So most of the products that we're producing are within the range 60 to 80 or 60 to 85 meters. So quite big blades now. Um, and certainly when you look back at where we were uh, only 10 years ago, 60 meters was considered um, a very large blade. That's now considered uh, a very small blade in most of our factories. Um, there are about 11 and a half thousand of us uh, in our engineering teams and, and production. Um, and so far, LM can say uh, we've built about 254,000 blades. So um, I can't remember what the exact percentage of every, every blade built so far is, but it's quite a high percentage. Um, like myself, I started as a naval architect and a boat builder, um, and so did LM. So LM started in Denmark as a boat building company and, and very soon realized it was more fun in wind. And I have the same basic path in my career. I started in boats. And whilst I still love sailing, I'm uh, very much more uh, into uh, renewables as a career. So that's LM as a company. Um, I was asked to talk about the design challenges and, and what, uh, what, what we face as our challenges. And I think we've covered some of those already, but I'll talk about them from our perspective. Um, this blade is the 107. So this is shown in, in one of our factories that's building this blade with all of the people who worked. And I think all of their families as well in a line next to it. So it just gives you a view of the scale of that blade. Um, this is for an offshore installation. So it's, it's a very, very large blade um, and designed to have a, a long lifetime with, with low service requirement. So reliability is the first thing that we put up. So in our design challenges, we need to have reliable blades and that's, uh, one of our key criteria. We test, we test again, we test a third time and we keep testing in multiple locations, including the Catapult, uh, who've got one of our blades at the moment that we've been doing testing on and have had for, for, for quite some time. Um, this is a key thing. And, and obviously as the energy industry has grown, 
we've seen the customers change from, uh, you know, if you go back 15 years to uh, the typical uh, people who were buying wind turbines, they were farmers, they were uh, small investors looking to buy three to four small uh, turbines to put in a field. Now uh, we've seen the, the, the move towards uh, major development, uh, developer utilities. And now we see some of the bigger companies like oil and gas coming involved. And, and you, you saw with, uh, with uh, recent auction rounds like Scotwind that our, our customers have changed into the big oil names. And that indicates also uh, an increase in somewhat the trust of the product for offshore. And I think we've managed to prove as an industry that we've, we can build offshore wind farms successfully and they do operate very well and they are reliable. But it puts a lot of pressure on the turbine and on the components to be very reliable. And obviously, as you move offshore, the cost of component repair and, co and, and, rep and component replacement goes up dramatically. So it really puts a lot of emphasis on reliability. The next thing is size. So when I joined the industry, we were building blades that were sub 20 meters uh, and very early 20 meters. And I can remember going through a design iteration of a 40 meter blade, and there was just no way we were ever going to build it. There was way too big we wouldn't be able to move it by road it would be far too complicated and um and would be uh, impossible to build but sure enough we built it and and it somewhat feels like we still have the same discussion and i guess um when you look at other industries like the aer aero industry with aircraft they've, they've basically sort of stopped growing aircraft got to a size with the a380 and then they now come down a little bit and they've stuck around the same sorts of sizes um we keep getting bigger and I don't think it's a trend that's going to stop anytime soon. And obviously, when we look at how we build blades, um, the, what we always think about is how, how feasible is it to build it? And we do certainly see different challenges now on the blades that are 100 plus meters to the ones we did, uh, or the ones that we certainly did 10, 15 years ago. It's a lot harder to build these blades and um, it takes a lot more time. It takes a lot more people and it takes a lot more equipment. And I think um, Tony, talked about the cost of manufacturing uh, and the cost of factories, the size of the buildings. I mean, it's when you look at a blade like this, you have to put a building around it and you have to be able to put maybe 10, 12 or, or 14 of these in a building to be able to, to run production and, and post molding and then, and then delivery. Um, and that leads to very, very large buildings. And, and what we typically find now is it actually becomes a planning problem. Um, it's hard to have the buildings as big as we need them. And, and when we do, we have to have so many um, special requirements on the building, like fire systems, um, it becomes incredibly expensive. So there's a limitation almost not just on the product, but also on the facilities that we can actually use to build these. Um, I was involved in, in a factory some years ago where we looked at um, the amount that people walked during a day um, and how we actually put uh, trackers on people. So as they walked around the factory and most people were, were completing a 10K uh, before they went home. So on a daily basis, they were walking 10,000 meters, which is an enormous amount. And obviously we also saw that the consumption of things like safety shoes was, was very high. They were working through the soles of their safety shoes very quickly. So we have to take into account all of these considerations when we look at blades. Yield, so in terms of yield, we're pushed always to get more out of blades. So it, it's not just a case of having a big blade, it also needs to perform at the very high end in terms of um, aerodynamic performance. And we're pushed on that. And there's obviously compromises in terms of size, weight, uh, aero profile structure that we have to take into consideration. But this is something where we see more push towards getting higher yield out of blades, but also getting more reliable yield and blades that perform on a regular basis at a higher level and have a guaranteed yield over a certain lifetime. So this is a major point. Um, a lot of the work we do related to materials and the development of the processes is to allow us to use different aero profiles to allow us to get more yield. So they're, they're, they're self-fulfilling. So each one, when we find a new material, we push the material to the boundary, it allows us to use a different aero profile, allows us to get a, a slightly better yield out of the blade. Um, and that allows us to do certain other things like was mentioned, reducing other components, reducing gearbox size, etc. Then cost. So this is a very complex item for blades. We obviously look at a capex cost for a blade. You know, how much does it cost the customer to buy a blade? But when you look at the lifetime cost, you know, you would never build uh, an onshore um, sort of steam power station or anything like that just looking at the cost of, of buying the equipment. You'd look at the total lifetime cost. 
and we start to see more developers looking at that now. What does reliability really mean in terms of cost? And how much are you willing to compromise on the cost of the initial outlay for the capex in terms of getting a higher reliability or higher yield? We start to see a lot more of those calculations coming now. And, and like I said, a lot of our developers and owners, um, they are a lot sharper with these now, these calculations, understanding the impact of a capex cost versus a lifetime cost. And then end to end responsibility is a really important one for us. Um, how do we make sure that the product we build, first of all, it's reliable to its end, um, however long that can be. And we've seen the lifetime of blades go up quite dramatically. But also, how do we make sure when it's decommissioned that we have a way to, um, to recycle it or, or to reuse it? And, and to some extent, we look at also things like life, uh, lifetime extension. So how far are we able to push turbines or how far can we take turbines beyond their original design life with the data that we now know and with the structural understanding that we have now? But if we have to end the turbine, what do we do with the components and, wh and where do we put them? So those are the challenges that we see. And so the next part is how do we deliver them? So this uh, picture is uh, what's called a Cypress turbine. Cypress is the name of, of one of our one of G's platforms that we provide blades to. Um, and this one's fairly unique. This is an onshore wind turbine that, um, again, it makes me sound old, but harking back to just 10 years ago, six megawatts was a fairly big offshore turbine. This is a six megawatt onshore machine. The biggest, uh, I guess, iterational change here is that we've managed to make blades, and these are blades 80, 80 plus meters long, 85, 90 meters long, that we can move by road because they're segmented. So these blades come into two pieces and we move them onto site in two pieces and then it's assembled into a turbine. Um, there's a lot of the reasons why we have that is it allows us to put longer blades onshore. So in sites where access is restricted or roads uh, don't allow very, very long blades, um, this allows us to put a larger rotor on a machine, um, which helps a lot with yield. Delivery is a lot easier. And with that also logistics, moving these components on ships, putting them uh, and delivery is a lot easier if you can have smaller components. That's another major benefit. Um, we have multiple blade options. So uh, you can have one root section and multiple tip sections, and that allows us to tailor the machine slightly towards different sites or to have uh, a lower capex investment if we want to have a specific platform for a certain project or for a certain market. And we're able to then optimize the AEP across certain projects or across certain wind farms um, using multiple tips. And coming back to the question about how much it costs us to build a factory, it allows us to utilize the factories in a different way. So we have smaller factories producing tips and we're able to use those. And we're also able to implement some automation that we, you know, we talk about the cost of implementation for automation on, on large production. This allows us to get closer to that with some of the tip production, but also on the root production um, where we're able to work with smaller components. So we do this, we've now produced about two and a half thousand of these, these turbines um, and it becomes one of our mainstay products. So it's in serial production. We're going into um, an iteration phase where we'll, we'll bring out a new uh, a new range of these turbines next year. And we're seeing some of the learning we got from this um, turbine going into that. So continuous evolution of this product as well, uh, but it's proved to be a very popular turbine. The next one that demonstrates what we're trying to do um, to, to, to ease the end of life is the Zebra project, uh, which stands for Zero Waste Blade Research. So this is a project that's been running for a few years now. It's a European project that we've been heavily involved with. So this is a 62 meter blade that was built in Ponferrada in Spain and it uses thermoplastic resin. So it's the first blade that we've built that's fully thermoplastic and it was redesigned to allow it to be more recyclable. So in terms of being able to separate components or being able to get uh, materials away and, and reuse it, it's been simplified. Um, so this is the first blade that we believe is 100% fully recyclable. Um, this blade is now in test um, and there will be another set going onto a turbine soon. And I think the expectation is that we will start to move into production with these blades very soon. So the last part is somewhat the next generation technologies. Um, there's already been quite a mention of additive technology. Um, GE have a history a long time before, I guess it was a, a trend uh, to use additive tech. Um, GE have been developing things like the 9X uh, engine fan blades for a long time using additive technology. 
And we've learned some from that. And um, we've, we've also implemented some of our own work on additive technology. So we have a blade additive research center in America. Um, we've produced tips and some parts of blades with additive, and we have uh, small scale production running on prototype sets. We've got flying sets to look at the evaluation of them in the field, but it's certainly a reasonable technology to take forward. We see it working on towers as well. So we've got, in terms of a uh, whole turbine, um, we also use additive technology for tower production. Um, we're now seeing this as being one of our future technologies going forwards. It's not without its learning. And I think um, what we always have to remember as an industry is that we typically take uh, a lot of these technologies out of their comfort zones. So a lot of the suppliers we deal with um, to produce um, things like the additive technology machinery, they're used to working small scale. And when they come to visit, even if we talk about scaling down or, or reducing the size of blades, they're still very large components. And we still take people generally out of their comfort zone. And that's true also for automation. If we bring automation companies in um, that are used to working in something like automotive industry, um, they find an entirely fresh set of challenges with what we do in production. Um, and it's always quite an interesting uh, first feedback session when you have a new company in a factory um, to see what they really think once they've seen it for real. But additive technology is definitely um, something that we, um, we're embracing. New materials, uh, there's a lot of new materials. Um, I think we acknowledge on the blades world that there's a lot of pressure on, on certain materials in the industry like carbon fiber. Um, carbon fiber industry is uh, a, a tough one at the moment. I think there's a lot of um, uh, further adoption in, in automotive and aerospace and, and other industries where um, the supply of carbon is probably not going to meet the demand. Um, and coming back to items like cost, what we don't want to do is end up with a, uh, a difficult market where we can't buy enough material to build the turbines that, that we want to meet Tony's five gigawatts per year in the UK. So we have pressure and that's leading us to look at other materials that might be able to replace things like carbon fiber or leading us to find other ways to, to use those materials in things like the process capability. So dealing with the processes, how can we get more out of the materials? So as Tony mentioned with design allowables, we constantly push to see how we can get more out of the material. If we're going to buy an expensive material like carbon fiber, how do we push it to get more out of it? It's one of our, our um, uh, things that gets us up in the morning and, and, and keeps us focused because that leads to lower cost blades, higher performance blades. So it brings everything back together. Um, and that really ultimately brings us uh, to, to a higher process capability on the blades that we, that, that we build. That's as much as I'm going to say for now before we go into the, uh, into the discussion. Thanks, Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, Sabrina, would you like to kick your presentation off. Thank you. Hello, I hope my screen is uh, well displayed. Um, yep. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, it's Sabrina Malpede, co-founder and managing director of ActBlade. Uh, today, I will present the vision of uh, uh, that ActBlade uh, brings to the wind energy industry, which is uh, uh, a new type of wind turbine blade built for a net zero future. Uh, well, <laughs> there has been a very uh, good presentation earlier today with uh, um, Mark and, and uh, Andrew uh, saying about the, the trend of developing very big uh, turbines, so uh, requiring larger blades and all the issues that the conventional machines are uh, proposing. So those blades are becoming very heavy. They require uh, extra stiffness. They are still produced with the very expensive, expensive processes. Uh, another very important point is actually the long lead time to market uh, um, and uh, the, uh, the difficulty to uh, recycle. So um, again, sorry for repeating a few of the concepts, but uh, I think this picture is just uh, saying uh, a couple of very important points. So conventional, we say conventional blade manufacturing, which is a modern blade manufacturing, so either a spar blade technology or a structural shell technology, is made of an upper shell, a lower shell, 
than either a spa, a spa or anyway, two or three uh, shear webs. Then the, uh, because of the uh, trailing edge, uh, uh, say the target millimeters, uh, it also needs some trailing edge, um, uh, trailing edge reinforcement. So just uh, looking at this picture is uh, uh, quite uh, organic to think that the, the, um, the uh, the conventional blade manufacturing impose a very unflexible um, uh, design uh, purpose because the, the aerodynamic design or the platform design of the blade has to be frozen before actually uh, ordering the, the tool for uh, the, the upper lower, uh, lower mold. And then uh, at the same time, uh, these, um, these tools are becoming gigantic. And so uh, as uh, Andrew said, it's not only about the cost of CapEx, but at the moment, even the cost of the manufacturing. So the manufacturing footprint is becoming uh, incredible. So what we propose is a completely innovative approach. Uh, uh, and uh, so our blade, the active blade is, uh, uh, what we say, the only modular, uh, the only controllable and uh, the most sustainable wind turbine blade. Why? It's made of a spar, so we still have a composite structure, but the, our spar is about 45% of the cord of the entire blade. So we actually, uh, even if we have a composite structure, but the, the size is a half in cord wise. And then uh, we have some ribs, um, uh, actually dis uh, uh, displaced on the back end uh, of the, the spar uh, all over the, the length of the, the blade. Then we have uh, those ribs, uh, depending on the position, can, can be more or less 48% of the cord. And then finally, we have uh, some buttons uh, that are actually not structural uh, and, uh, and are there just to define the shape of the training edge. And then it's fully covered by textile. Uh, so actually, I'm showing here the textile we use for covering uh, the blades, and we can discuss about that uh, later on. On top of that, we have other uh, systems. So, so our textile is covering the entire blade, and it's not disconnected. So it's a full surface. It's there because it's forming actually the blade aerodynamic surface. The textile is tensioned, it's tensioned in two directions, the edge wise uh, just to maintain the aerodynamic shape and the in span wise uh, just to avoid wrinkling while blades are bending uh, in both directions. Then we have a tip. Uh, the tip is solid, it's uh, more or less five meters, uh, but actually can be even longer or shorter depending on the variation of blade length that we want to produce. It's there as a solid tip because it's not only used to terminate the textile, but also to have all the lightning protection system. So that's uh, uh, the, uh, the blade. So it's a, uh, our blade is modular, it's an assembly of subsystem, and, uh, and we are able to uh, have a very flexible design and manufacturing. And so we are able to develop a new blade more rapidly than everyone else. And this is also promoting uh, high quality, apart of the reduction of cost. So let's go in detail about what, what we see, you know, how we structure actually our, uh, our system, uh, um, our strategic modularity. So we see uh, the, the blade made of, of systems. Uh, and so we are actually able not to design a blade as a monolithic approach, but actually it is going to be a system based approach. So we have a spar, we have ribs, we have a, a, the tensioning system. Some of those systems, like the tensioning system, is uh, repeatable across a range of, uh, uh, of uh, blades, so actually all ranges, because the edge wise. Uh, um, Tension uh, um, stiffness required, strength required is uh, very similar actually uh, along uh, across the, the, the various blades, a very a various uh, length, and so the the tensioning in in span wise. At the same time, this promotes also like a, a, a 
what we are uh, we have defined already are the standard interface among all those system what we are uh, promoting in the first and then in the next uh, actually product is uh, to make those interface uh, very standard so we can actually expand massively our supply uh, chain this is, this means that uh, if we look at the geometrically specific tools, we only have a spar as a geometrically specific tool. Uh, uh, actually, what we call a family of blades because we are still able to uh, to define the root interface and the tip length uh, in a uh, in a variation of, uh, with the, the different variation and with the, the ribs we can also have different uh, curvature at different pace. So. That, that is the only geometrically specific. The rest can be reused, and most importantly, all the assembly jigs uh, can be reused. Just to uh, say, uh, like a, a study from Morgan Stanley, uh, in automotive, this type of approach that uh, Act Blade is promoting has uh, uh, shown to have a, a development time reduced by 30%, a unit cost lowered by 20%, mostly because on uh, labor costs, we are not, we do not have cost to reconverting, uh, uh, to reconvert the entire manufacturing facility as conventional blade does. Uh, and so the increased assembly productivity and material. Then, uh, on top of that, uh, uh, let's, uh, 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 here I want to show how not only modularity, but also the act blade approach is more sustainable than any other blade. Uh, first of all, let's speak about the topics. Uh, we have seen that just the geometrically specific uh, uh, tool is 45% uh, of, the, the, uh, of um, an entire mold. And something very important to say that we do not have a, a trailing edge, we do not have to develop a very, uh, a very uh, difficult, from a manufacturing point of view, uh, concavity, uh, concavity mold shape. And this is reducing actually uh, the, the cost of capex uh, massively between 30 to 55 percent depending on uh, on the tools the other point is actually that our textile is already white so we do not need a painting shop uh, this means that from a factory footprint, just not having the painting shop is reducing by 30% more or less the factory footprint. We have also shown uh, on our cost, uh, cost model that we are able to uh, get the same number of blades out of the door with uh, less mold than a conventional blade manufacturing, just because of the assembly approach. And then finally, uh, from a labor point of view, again, we, not, we, uh, we do not have any paintings that is more or less uh, on a 50 meter blade is going to cost 21 uh, hours. And so, uh, but uh, we also have less bonding uh, and so uh, definitely less uh, labor from, uh, from all, all these uh, manufacturing employed in uh, laying material, uh, as I said, all over the, 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 the edgewise uh, direction of the, the molds in conventional blade manufacturing. And again, in terms of sustainability metrics, we have actually uh, been looking at the CO2 reduction of our blade manufacturing versus conventional blade. Uh, so just about the, if we think of just about the heating, the mold surface, uh, we are actually able to uh, uh, reduce the, um, the energy produced, uh, the energy consumption about 36-7%, but also uh, in terms of the, the, all the, um, the factory footprint, uh, in, so air conditioning, uh, water use, overheads. But the other very important point, we do not have a painting shop, so we do not have any fume extraction, dirty water, no PPE uh, management. And then another point I would like just to say uh, is that uh, we, in the infusion, just because we do not have the, uh, the training edge part, we are able to reduce the consumable, which is a complete 100% waste, by more or less 35%. 
Uh, and as well, the, we use very little foam. We use practically 75% less foam than conventional blade manufacturing. And the foam we, we use is already a uh, recycled material because it's a PET. Uh, uh, here we are showing where we are in terms of technology. So what I have said so far has been already demonstrated uh, on our first uh, uh, on, uh, five mini series of five uh, blades production. So we developed the five 13 meter long blade, uh, one which survived this, uh, the structural test of the offshore renewable energy catapult last year in March 2021. 20, uh, and then we have also uh, run a six months uh, of uh, testing in, on, in operating uh, conditions so on a B27 uh, testing turbine uh, in Mayer here, uh, here in south of Glasgow. That uh, test has uh, been uh, completed successfully on the 31st of January 2022. Uh, from an IP po position point of view, we have a very strong IP position. Our uh, we have two family of patents. The first one is covering just the manufacturing method, it has been already granted in UK, China, US, and the rest of, uh, of Europe. And, and then we have, thanks to the ribs, we have also the opportunity to uh, to change the shape in uh, uh, while flying. And this uh, a, a this patent has also been granted in the same. Country countries uh, uh, for the first uh, family. Moving forward, so we are already developing our first commercial prototype, which is called the ACT-100. It's a 49 meter long blade, and it's made for, uh, uh, as a replacement blade to, uh, to make wind farm to last longer, so to extend the life by 10, uh, 10 years, and actually to in, uh, increase productivity about uh, 8 to 9%. Um, so this uh, is going to be a replacement for MM92 um, uh, um, uh, blades. Then uh, following that from 2024, our aim is actually to scale to uh, developing new blades for new turbines uh, is the act of 150. Uh, uh, that, uh, 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 in that uh, commercial prototype, we are actually uh, going to go complete uh, forward with our module approach, a sustainable approach. This is some images of our first product. Um, one important point in all our stories actually that uh, for, a, uh, for a year now, we have been working with the Enel Green Power, uh, which is one of the largest energy company in the world. Uh, they are uh, very interested in our approach and most importantly, have offered to uh, test our uh, first blades in the first of a kind that hopefully deploy farther. There. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the attention here for any question. Back to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Sabrina. In fact, we, we have got a question from Niall um, for you. Um, and they ask, is, is the textile material able to withstand material degradation from leading edge erosion, extreme loads from combined loading? Example, stretching of textile fabric. Uh, okay, so textile is actually, uh, our textile is uh, actually the new material in the wind energy industry. So we have, uh, uh, since uh, since the outset, we started with uh, DMVGL, what is called uh, a technology uh, assessment and actually development. So we have developed a list of uh, uh, Tech, of tests that we do actually make sure that the textile is durable uh, it, under uh, obviously the structural condition, but as well as the environmental condition. Uh, so uh, our textile uh, lasts uh, actually more than uh, any other uh, any blade in terms of uh, leading edge uh, erosion. We are uh, uh, we are constantly improving our uh, uh, coating because on the top of the textile is actually the textile is made of uh, uh, two um, uh, two uh, components. So we have a substrate that is actually. Uh, like a woven fabric, and then they, uh, we have uh, the coat, and the coat is actually developed for uh, improve, uh, maximizing actually the, uh, the durability to environmental uh, environmental agent 
At the moment, the test shows that our textile disease is actually equivalent to the leading, the, the most uh, used the leading edge uh, protection. And however, is uh, uh, extra protection is required. We can always uh, put uh, um, uh, put uh, the, the tapes on top of it and the. the we, and I said, uh, I said that an important benefit of our technology that uh, we can actually put uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tapes while uh, on a flat surface rather than on a curved surface and then putting the textile on top of the blade. That's super. Um, uh, a question for Andrew. What is the projection of how big blades will be in the next 10 to 30 years and how do you foresee a limit to the size before blades are too large to manufacture, install, and maintain? That's a good question. I think um, if you'd have asked me 20 years ago, I'd have said 40 meters. Um, I think clearly we've moved, we, we're making the kind of moves that, that uh, we expected to see. And I, I think the thing about the wind industry, is, as Sabrina certainly knows, we're slow adopters of, of radical changes to technology. And that's all related to risk. The, the industry grows so fast that we have to mitigate risk. And to do that, we stick with what we know. And um, frustrating for anyone who's got a new technology or wants to come in with something revolutionary because we'll be very slow to, to listen or adopt it. But when we do adopt it, it'll then be a mainstream. Um, I think we start to see split blades. We start to see uh, additive tech. We start to see other new uh, technologies like Sabrina's. So we, we do start to turn the ship slightly towards things like modularity, and that will help. So realistically, I don't see us getting blades that much longer before we see we have to have things like modularity in, um, in mainstream production. However, I would say we're still some years away from seeing that being, certainly for the offshore industry, the mainstream, because the, the, the risk profile for offshore projects is, is just so different to onshore. Using a new technology or a radical technology or, a, or, or segmented technology on, on an onshore blade is, is something that you can do and, and to some extent manage the risk of. The cost of a problem offshore um, is what would put most developers off having that in their portfolio at the moment. And, and it, it'll be a challenge. It'll be a technology ultimately we have to prove onshore before we move offshore. So. Right. They'll get bigger yet, but I would believe not that much bigger before we see major change. Right. There's a question here uh, for you as well, Andrew. Um, is a Cypress jointed blade adhesive or mechanically joined on site? Mechanically joined on site. So the tips are removable. Um, so you can interconnect and we have run projects where we take a turbine during life and change, to, change the tip type um, or update to a different tip. Um, so it's not, I would say, um, it's not our plan to have a, um, an adhesively bonded tip in, in, in turbines like Cyprus. Rightio, thank you. Um, there's another one here. How much of an issue is blade edge uh, erosion going to be for, required for a blade lifetime of 35 years on the largest turbines? Well, yeah, I could probably um, speak to that first. Um, Certainly uh, the catapult, um, we're exploring options around metallic leading edges, um, particularly to actually reduce uh, essentially the, the O&M costs of re replacing um, the imposition of, of the cost in service. Um, and, and certainly predictions are made, we can actually um, look to have life of, of, of blade um, around that, um, but only for one or two specific material systems. There are, is this interesting interplay where maybe there's there's uh, less suitable materials in terms of, of, of total time for, for erosion capability um, and then that trade-off of, of utilities of what they want to do in terms of service life. As uh, to the rest of the panel, is, uh, is there any other points around that you'd like to expand upon? Uh, if I can say actually with the, the textile uh, we have an opportunity actually to replace entirely the textile during the life of a wind turbine blade. So that uh, means, and we are actually protecting the composite structure that, uh, you know, is, it can be damaged. And the damage on the composite means a, da a structural damage. 
in the damage journal textile is not a structural damage and the textile does not, um, does not uh, have any structural uh, strength to the blade. Mm. Uh, a question to you, Sabrina, more, I guess we're in the, the, the panel section, if you like, we're, we're just on time now, but I'll, I'll continue. And I guess those who aren't interested will drop off the call, but because um, it's strangely, we didn't, we didn't go to the full hour. So a uh, question for you, Sabrina, what, what was your decision point or, or do you see a time actually where um, ActBlade would, would partner with other, other uh, manufacturers that you would do w one particular segment with a, Act blade um, uh, variant we are doing and it. a segment. Uh, you are already doing that. Yeah. So our uh, first product, the Act One Hundred, we will uh, produce the the spa and doing the assembly. So the rest will be already done. So the textile comes in roll. The tension system will be actually done by a, um, a supply chain uh, uh, that of com really no special composite manufacturer, mm -hmm. uh, and so the ribs. And, uh, and so there's a complete the tip segment from a, a different manufacturer that you will yeah. be using. Yeah, yeah, completely different. Uh, the different man manufacturer actually having different type of skills. Uh, so uh, and, and we will do the assembly also for an IP point of, uh, point of view. So they say uh, our vision is uh, a, a, from a supply chain point of view is also to develop uh, uh, and enable wind energy development very quickly in new countries because we can actually uh, develop local supply, uh, local supply chain, but as well to suit the context. case. Yep. Yeah. Very easily. Yeah. But more of a general question to both of you, an opportunity to sort of um, uh, spitball a few things. What, 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 what do you see or what, what do you um, look forward to the most in terms of, of future technology development in blades? Uh, to, to us is the use of recycled uh, fibres and also the new fibres like uh, uh, natural fibres. Uh, we are super interested in all of that. In the past, uh, uh, in 2018, we already used the recycled carbon fibres. They are already very, still very expensive, uh, but uh, this is definitely something that uh, uh, is very interesting to us. Andrew, I, I, got I anything to say there? Yeah, no, I'd say the same. I, I think um, it's been in the industry, or it's been in, in, in sort of, I guess, in the tumbleweed of the industry for a while. There was a potential to build blades with recyclable materials, and it's never really gathered the kind of momentum that it has now. You know, going back 10, 15 years, there were discussions about, re, you know, the types of fibres that we're looking at and the types of resins that we're looking at, and it was just never quite there. And I think there was there was resistance to change because it wasn't required or it wasn't seen as being required but we now see there's a lot of momentum behind it and I think that's great we really you know we're producing renewable energy uh you know uh, equipment we really should be able to produce that without leaving a massive landfill uh, footprint at the Indeed. end so yeah. I, I really do see that being one of the one of the major ones for us cool um and there's another one there um with news that LM are collaborating with Vestas in Brazil how important with Will standardization and collaboration through the supply chain be to realizing the scale of deployment? Interesting question. Um, we are collaborating with Vestas in Brazil, but in many ways, I mean, Vestas are one of many, many customers we have. So um, we are a GE owned company, but we have 30 different customers, of which all of the major OEMs, I think, are, are, are in that in that. Um, portfolio. So Vestas will be no different to any other customer that we have. You know, we currently produce blades for uh, other turbine OEMs in four or five different locations and, and run uh, the same blade, same process, same everything in different in different locations. So it won't be any different to that. No worries. Um, and probably a final one for you, because we'd like to wrap up now. We're a bit over time. Um, numbers are, are dropping. Um, I could probably take this, but no, actually I'll, I'll give it to Andrew in light of... Um, um, zebra. So what is the strength to weight ratio of thermoplastic resin compared to GRP? Oh, uh, interesting question. Um, not much of a loss in terms of using the new resins. It just, uh, the, the major differences we see is not in uh, the mechanicals of the actual material. It's more in the handling and usage. So environmental conditions mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, in terms of the mechanical performance, obviously it's, 
it's not yet at the point where it's, I'd say, equivalent to an epoxy or a high end epoxy, but it's certainly an equivalent to some of the other materials used like polyesters and vinyl esters. And in terms of fatigue life, uh, any? I'll let you know when we finish the blade test. <laughs> in, in laboratory testing, it's good. And I think it's certainly, you know, we talk about, you know, th these materials were around some time ago, but not in the kind of level they're at now. They've, yeah, they've yeah. you know, they've worked very hard with materials like MMAs and thermoplastics to, to bring on the technology. And I think we're just starting to see them becoming, you know, comparable now to, to what we would expect from a mainstream resin. Um, but I'll let you know. I mean, the full size blade test is the ultimate way to test it. So, Indeed. Uh, I'll yeah. let you know. Fantastic. And with that, we'll wrap things up. Thank you very um, much to our, our guests for contributing. Um, it has been wonderful to have you both contribute. It was a really good session. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll follow on. I'll, I'll see if both of you would we'd be willing to share um, slides later on. And if that's the case, we, we can send things out um, uh, if that's okay to do so. Um, so for everyone on the webinar, um, uh, that you'll expect to see something in an email soonish. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, everyone, um, there's uh, webinars for the rest of the week. So log on and, and, and say hello to people, I guess, and ask some questions. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, Mark. See ya.